Right, hello everybody and welcome yet to another live session here on Facebook. Now, I'm going to go through 10 different things tonight. I decided instead of doing a, a painting, which is what I normally do, I'm going to go through 10 different kind of watercolour random tips, which I can give you, kind of um, techniques, that sort of thing. And uh, right at the end, right at the very end, so stay tuned, I'm going to show you about a little bit more about watercolour white and the different types which you can buy. Okay, so let's just see where we go from here and uh, let's make a start. Now, if you fancy learning how to paint wildlife in watercolour, come and join me and my members on patreon.com forward slash the Devon Artist. Click on become a member, choose one of the tier levels as you can see here, and uh, choose one that's going to suit your needs. And let me kind of show you how to paint wildlife in watercolour. Okay, back to the video. Right, okay, here we go. Right, what we're going to start off with first of all, or by the way, put a comment down below, I'd like to kind of hear from you. I will keep checking as I'm going along here as well. Now, the first kind of tip I want to give you, with all this that I've got here, and some other stuff which is behind me, which is off camera, is, you know when you've got a dirty palette? So I'll just move that one out of the way a minute. I'll bring this one into shot, okay? Which is this one. And this is, as you can see, it's a little bit on the old dirty side, so it's not very good. <laughs> now, the thing is, when you finish doing a painting as well, very often you wash your palette out, Fresh tissue, fresh water, fresh clean palette, ready to make a start with. But the thing is, sometimes it's worth not washing it out. Pardon? Really? Yeah, honestly, because the good thing about watercolour is that you can just simply reactivate the watercolour paint itself. And that's what I like about it, you know, you can just add water to it. So I'll just show you what I mean. So when we get my old mixing brush, we can either use like a water spray bottle like this, which I tend to use. Little pipette, so you can pop that little bit pep in there. There you go, like that. Or you just get an old mixing brush and just reactivate that paint. Now, this paint has been in this palette now for two days. And to be honest with you, I've come back to a palette quite a long way down the road, you know, probably about two or three months sometimes, and I can re wet that watercolour paint and start all over again. And that will be more than paintable straight after. So that's just one colour, as you can see. So let's just go for the blue. It's like a bluey grey colour, a bit like a, yeah, a little bit like a grey, greyish blue on there, a very, very kind of faint one. Okay, so that's that one. And that's what you've got to do, really wet. The only thing you tend to find sometimes, actually, you know, when you're using a, a granulating colour, a bit like French Ultramarine, you find with French Ultramarine, for example, it might start breaking up within there. Now, this has got French Ultramarine in there, and you can just about make out some of the blue colour within the half pan, or within the, the, the well, should I say, not half pan. In there, so that's what tends to happen, right? Okay, so that's a little bit about re wetting the paints, just a little bit, and adding those colors in as you go along. Got the idea? So remember that when you start working with the paint. So never throw your palette or never wash it out straight away because it might come in handy. So yes, you might not want some of those colors for your next painting, but there are colors which you may need to reuse. And when you think my kind of colour palette, which are my half pans here, tend to be the ones I use most of the time. Invariably, one of these colours is still in there, okay? So, yeah, I know it's a wasteful world, isn't it? So let's not try and waste too much in the way of paint. Okay, so that's a little bit about re-wetting your palettes and making use of what paint's already in there. Even if it's a few months down the line, okay? Right, so that's that one. Now, other than that, I'm just trying to see who else is on the line here. So if you want to say hello, please post a comment down below. Or if you want me to answer a question for you, you're more than welcome to post down below as well. So what I'm going to talk about this time around is something to do with too much water. Now, the thing is, when you first start using watercolours, it's trying to get the hang of how they tend to work. You know, So you think, well, how much water do you need to add? Why is it too wet? Why is it not as dark as I wanted it to be? It's all down to how the water flows on the paper. So just make sure there's nothing on this piece of paper. Oh, one thing you've got to be careful of, by the way, when you've got natural oils on your hands, try not to rub on the watercolour paper because that acts like a like a wax resist, 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 I can't say the words, like a wax resist. And because of that, you find that your paint won't, won't stick onto the paper. Right, let's go for a colour first. What we're going to do, I'm going to wet an area. I'll show you what to do with the water. Good way of testing it out. Now, when you first wet a piece of watercolour paper, it's bone dry, obviously, and that water's got to soak into that paper. Now, I very often say on my Patreon website with my um, 
members on there is that when you wet something, wet it two or three times, or in this case quite a few times, because it's quite warm underneath the lights here. So keep re-wetting, keep re-wetting. Try not to rub it too much because then you pull the sizing off the paper. Now all the sizing is, is a means of uh, preventing it from being like a blotting paper. And that's what they do for the manufacturing process. So the water soaks in, but it doesn't just spread out everywhere like some wildness, you know, you don't want that to, that to happen. So allow the water to soak in. And you can just see, I don't know if I'll be able to show you on the paper there. You see the shine there. Now that's not running down the paper, it's running like a waterfall, then it's too wet. So if I get a fully loaded brush, pop it on, that's far too wet. And if it goes on like that, you can either lift some off by using a semi-dry brush, so dry brush and some tissue, lift some of that off, and then get a little bit of colour, and add that colour in. Now this colour is welling up in the middle. See how it's all running down there? Now that's okay for some effects, but to be honest with you, if you want it to blend out nice and neatly, you would need, <laughs> could that go? You would need the paper to be just damp, really, to be honest with you. So let's just re wet another area next door to it. So the way that runs down, see all the streaks in there? So this time, what I'm going to do, I'm going to wet one of another area here and just let it soak in just a little bit. Hi, Liz. Nancy Ann, hello there. <laughs> And Teresa, hello Teresa. Just saying hello to people. I've got the computer on obviously by the side of me, it should have because I'm obviously uh, going live. I'm live once again, don't tell anybody. Okay, now I'm gonna let that soak in to the paper just a little bit. See how this has all gone all streaky down the side there. Great, brilliant, if you want that effect. But if you let it soak in, you find it's still got a shine on it, but it's not gonna run down the paper. And because of that, just give that a minute, because of that you find that it could blend a little bit easier. I think we're just about there already to be honest with you. So I'm going to go for a different colour this time. Let's go for some uh, some red. Oh, look at that. Isn't that lovely? A little bit of red. A bit more. Let's make it a bit more intense. Now that's not running right down like some mad thing, is it? I'm going to go for a little bit of orange. Start down there actually. I'm working my way up. And because it's not too wet, it's not running down like this one did down the sides. I've just obviously blended that out. And because of that, obviously that's a little bit another way of controlling this water. And if it still runs a little bit, you can come back with a clean damp brush. Just light this off on that edge down. And one of my tips I tell my patrons on patreon.com is just to wet below the area like so and then just light circles little tickles just to blend that very edge into the damp paper so you can't see where one color starts and the white of the paper as you finishes if you know what i mean so it's kind of blend into nice nice together just like that so that's what you want to be able to do so that's a little bit about having it too wet or not wet enough if it's not wet enough this is what's going to happen right i'm going to put some just one layer of water on just down there okay Ooh more water there, I love that. Okay, what else we got? <laughs> Let's have a quick look. I'm gonna go for a little bit of brown. That's one layer of water on there. Now, that's one layer, and it's running, it's working, but you find you haven't got much work time on there, and because of that, it will dry very quickly indeed, as you can see there. So one last tip with something like this, all you need to remember is that wherever the water goes, all right, let's just do a little bit of a water run, is where the paint will also go. Put another bit there, a bit there. So just dab on the water, there you go. So wherever the water goes is where the paint will go as well. The paint will follow the water. So that's all you need to remember when you're working with watercolours. It won't go into a dry section, okay? So that's a little bit about how much water to add to the paper. It's all through trial and error, and it also depends on the kind of quality of the paper that you're using, so bear that in mind. Okay, now if you've got any questions, remember to post them below. 
I'd uh, like to hear from you today. Um, let's have a quick look what else we got. Now, the thing about watercolour, as I mentioned, just, just mentioned about the quality of paper, is that the paper type does really make a difference, really, when you're, when you're trying to do a, a detailed painting. Um, you can get some very inexpensive papers. I don't want to say any names or anything like that. But you really can get some very cheap papers, some very inexpensive papers. And because of that, they don't work that well with the paint. So you can have really good quality paints, but very cheap paper. And you find the effect is not quite the way you want it to be. And also, the colour as well makes a big difference. So let me just give you a, de a demonstration on that one second. When you look at different watercolour papers, this is some freebies which I've got from Bockingford actually. So bear with me a minute while I just make a lot of noise. Now then, here we go. Look. Let's not put it on the wet paint pool. So the idea is you've got all these different types here of paper. You've got HP. Oh, that's a different one. What's that one? Ooh, that's a rough. So you've got a very rough textured paper, which is this one here, and it is really rough. Really, really rough. I'm not painting because I want to save this. But it's very rough textured. So that's great if you want to use a dry brush effect. So if you wanted to get something like a little bit of colour and just scumble over the texture of the paper to create a dry brush effect. And it's great for walls, um, kind of um, rough areas like stonework, that kind of thing. And you can see just by skimming the paper using the side of the brush, when you do that on rough paper, you find on rough paper, it gives it even more of a rough effect, obviously, because it was its rough paper. The other one is hot pressed. Now hot pressed, a lot of botanical artists use that because it's a very smooth, very smooth watercolour paper. Now people have asked me, why don't I use hot press? Now, I don't use it because I quite enjoy using something with a medium texture, which is what this one is here, uh, which is the Bockingford one, the Bockingford normal one. Um, but you could use it for, for very detailed work. But I do tend to find, personally anyway, that when I'm doing a large background wash on a hot press paper, I don't seem to have the kind of same effect and the same kind of usability for time uh, when I'm trying to get that wash on there. So that's just my personal preference, but I'm sure people use different things than I do. Um, the other one you've got there is cold press, which is not, now this is the same as the one I've got here. So the idea is, is that if it's CP not, capitalized N-O-T, basically means it's not gone through hot rollers, which is basically what this one is here, okay? So hot press gone through hot rollers when they make the paper, not hot pressed. <laughs> As in cold pressed, has gone through cold rollers, obviously. Then there's a rough version, which is the same as that one there for white, and the same with that one there, which is obviously cold pressed, 140 pound. Now, 140 pound is the weight of the paper, which is quite a standard watercolour paper thickness. If you're working with a large sheet of paper or you're going to put a lot of washes on there, you'll need to tape down your paper and preferably stretch it first as well. And all basic stretching means is by soaking it in water just for two, well, three or four minutes. It depends on the size of the sheet of paper. There's different ways, different methods I know. And then what you would do with the wet paper, you would tape it down to the board. Some people staple it around the edge of the board by doing that first, okay? And then leave it to dry in normal temperature, room temperature for a few hours. Then it's pre-stretched. So when you re-wet that paper, you will find it will not cockle and bend quite as much. In fact, very often it will just dry nice and flat afterwards again, because you've already stretched it. Okay, so that's a little bit about paper that you've got there. So good quality paper and bad quality paper. I'll give you a slight example here. Now you can see the quality of these washes on here. Now I'm going to use the same colour. hope this works. I'm going to use the same colour, which is a carmine red. This is a less quality paper. All right, just that one. And this particular one, get the same colour again is a better quality paper. Now look at the difference between those two there. I'll just bring them both into shot. So that's a cheaper paper, that's a Bockingford. Now you can see instantly there's a difference and this is exactly the same mix of paint, nothing different. That's the difference. This is The Bockingford paper is the middle of the road, good quality paper. It's not top high-end paper, but I use it all the time. I just love using it. As you know, I'm a professional artist and there's one I tend to get used to using. Okay, so that's your difference on papers, and that's a little bit for you about watercolour papers. Oh, I've got some of those. Oh, that Liz, thank you. <laughs> okay, right. So, what we got next, what I wanted to do, while I've just got some paint on the paper here, 
is talk to you a little bit about how to soften an edge. Now, there's different ways of doing this. I've already shown you the way by using, let me just put that back over there, by using this one here to create a soft edge. And that, if you remember, was by simply having a wet area, like so. Add your color in. But add your color in away from the furthest wet area. So I've wetted to here, but I'm going to put the color into about there. Now what that gives you is a very soft edge. But people say, well, how do you soften an edge that's already dry? So, okay, well that can vary because it depends on the paint as well. Some paints are staining, some paints are not staining. So some paints will move around when they're, when, once you dry them, if you re-wet really them. So it all depends on the paint as well. So bear that in mind when you do this. Plus also, it can also depend on the brush you're using. So I've got a size five sable brush here. I do like the synthetic and I, I think eventually I'll probably go for all synthetic. But I just want to show you, let's go for the yellow. So I'm going to put a line of water just below the yellow, leaving a gap in between. Just a line of water. Now I'm going to tickle those two colors, two colors, I'm going to tickle the edge of the yellow into that line of water. Just tickle it little circles, just like that. And that is how you soften an edge and get rid of that hard edge on the yellow. Now, if you wanted to, you could just go a little bit higher and just blend it evenly. So now you've got a gradual blend, just a gradated wash effectively is what you've got there. So I'll just do a little darker area now. Now, sometimes it won't move. As I say, it depends on the pigment, depends on what you've got. So I'm going to wet this area around here, just away from the color, like so. And I'm going to tickle the edge of this, there you go, into that wet area. I'm going to probably do it down here as well. Just wash your brush out. Keep washing your brush out because that makes a difference as well. Just to soften that very edge. Now, if it doesn't shift, what you can do is use a bristle brush. So like an acrylic brush or oil painting brush, but one of the finer ones, you know? So if it's a staining color like those there, what you can do, I'll just get this one. Now this is an old cheap, very cheap old brush, which I've squished with a pair of pliers. And I can use that to very lightly, I don't want to press too hard because it'll damage your paper. Just move that paint on the end in towards the wet area. So that's just two ways that you can blend and soften a hard edge paint. Okay, hello Erna, how are you today? <laughs> so that'll give you some ideas on those. So that's a little bit about softening edges. Again, I go through all this from my Patreon videos. As you know, just down there in the corner, if you wanna have a look on there, have a look for the free Robin tutorial. If you've not heard about it yet, I do mention it on all my videos. There's no signing up, there's no email address exchange or anything like that. You get quite a few hours worth of free video lesson on how to paint a rocking robin, or robin anyway. And uh, with that, I'll give you the outline drawing and the reference photo as well. All just from me and all for free. So pop on patreon.com forward slash the Devon Artist. Have a look at that. Okay, so other than that, let's have a quick look. One thing I mentioned about as well in the past is taping down your paper. Now I tend to use masking tape. Now the masking tape I use is not some special one from an art shop. Well, I say that I have got some from an art shop, but I've not used that yet. This one is painters and decorators tape. Just cheap, cheerful, 50p a roll, something like that kind of tape. That's all it is. And it's not too tacky. Now, if it's really tacky, what you want to do, just take a little bit, just a little bit, let's move that back over a little bit for you. Just take a little bit off on, on your jeans or something like that, as long as it's not too fluffy, once you get it all over the tape. And that way, that when you take the tape off the paper, there's less chance, I'm not saying it won't, there's less chance it could tear the paper. So what I'll do, I'll just give you an idea of what I mean by that. We can get different colours, by the way. I've got um, a blue masking fluid as well, which is quite nice. So if I just move that to there for you, just one minute. Uh, let's have a quick look. That's it. Now... When I take the masking tape off, make sure the paint is nice and dry and the paper is bone dry before you do it. Otherwise you will tear the paper. Don't take the masking tape off towards the painting. Take it away from the painting. 
by doing that, if it's going to tear, let it tear outwards, away from the, from all that art, artwork you've put on there, all that time you spent doing the uh, the painting. And when you take the masking tape off, that gives you a lovely clean, straight, or ish, edge, as you can see. So I can do the same if I want to down the bottom. And there you go. That's a little bit about masking tape. That simple. That simple. That's all it is about masking tape. So bear that in mind. You don't have to buy really expensive tape. You can get the washi tape, which is the one I did order some from China, but it never arrived. What happened to that then? Has one of you guys got it? I want to know. <laughs> right, okay. So that's that one on masking tape. Now, we've gone through softening edges and we've also gone through blending a dry edge as well. So what we want to look at, I'm just going to make sure there's no comments on there. No, no one has commented on there. As I say, if you want to ask me a question, then please do. I'll see what I can do for you. Right, okay, quick slurp of coffee and we'll carry on. One thing I want to talk about as well are colours. Now, there's so many different paints on the market, there really is. It's just a minefield of paints and different different things you can buy from Winsor & Newton to, to uh, Sennelier to SAA to, well, De La Rowney. There's so many, there's so many, and there's a lot more I've not mentioned. So which ones do you choose and how do you kind of work out what you're going to pay for? Because they're not cheap, are they? When you first buy them, you think, okay, you know. Which one shall I buy? Now, my recommendation to you, and I say to all my patrons on patreon.com, is to buy the best that you can afford, and that goes to the watercolor paper as well. So if you can afford reasonable quality paints, then I suggest you buy those reasonable quality paints. If you can only afford the cheaper versions of paints, then that's what you get, that's, that's fine, that's not a problem at all. But obviously you can't expect miracles with, with uh, cheaper paints and cheaper paper. The difference with the cheaper paints, out of interest by the way, is, where's my pointing stick, there we go, is that some paints you find tend to be the student quality and some are professional quality. Now what's the difference? The main difference between that is that they have what's called filler within the paints, which obviously tend to boost up obviously the, the consistency which is in there as well. So you've got filler and you've got pigment, are the main two. Now. The cheaper paints have more filler than pigment, the pigment being the colour obviously, and the more expensive paints tend to have more pigment than filler. So that will then give you the idea is that if you've got more pigment, one, it could be a rich colour, which it will be much richer, and also that paint will last you a lot longer as well because you're not running it down too quick. So these paints in here, these are all professional ones, but I do use student ones as well. And the ones I tend to use are Winsor Newton Cotman, and um, also Windsor & Newton Professional. I do have SAA, I do have De La Rowney as well, and I've got the odd Sennelier um, as well, knocking about, which kind of give us some ideas on what I'm using there. So what paints have you got? Which ones are you using? So let me know, just stick it down in the comments down below, because it'd be quite interesting actually to kind of gauge on the most popular ones that people tend to use the most, you know. So um, is yours Windsor & Newton? I know mine are. So that'll give you some ideas on that, on a little bit about um, about paints and the way they tend to work. That's just the very basics, obviously, but there's so, so much more I could tell you about that, which, again, I go over that one on Patreon with my members on there. Okay, so let's have a quick look. One thing I want to talk about as well is when you start a painting, and you know, I've been working to start on the Osprey last week, didn't I, which I want to carry on with. I've not carried on with that yet is I like to kind of test out the colours first. So, hold on a second. Back in a minute, hang on. I'm not going anywhere, I'm still here. I'm just digging out some paper for you. Okay, Nancy Ann, Daniel Smith. I see you've got on there. Thank you, Nancy Ann. Now, when I start on a painting, I do this. I kind of go through my palette, I look at the photograph, I scrutinise the photograph, I can pinch in to a large photograph on my tablet. It's got to be a large photo though. And then I can work out the colours. For example, I've got some different colours for different things I've been painting here. And this will give us some ideas on how it all works. So by working with the colours, thinking about the consistency, and playing with the colours first, just some odd scraps of watercolour paper. That's all they say. I've even used either side of this one. It doesn't really matter. Watercolour paper, you can normally use both sides. This particular brand you can anyway. Um, so it's well worth practicing and trying out your colours first before you go to the main painting. Because at least that way, you've got some idea on the kind of colours you'll be using for the project itself. 
without kind of making too many color mistakes in the middle of the painting and thinking, oh no, I'm gonna have to start again. How many times have you done that? I know I have, I've done it. So you're not the only one, all right? So that's a little bit for you about um, kind of testing out before you begin. So test your paints, test your colors before you start on that painting project. Okay, right. So that's that one. I'm just gonna check the comments on the old internet. There's one second there. Teresa, hello, Teresa Terry May. I, I use Windsor Newton, but I've just bought a set of Sinelia. Yeah, they're supposed to be good paints, aren't they, Sinelia? I've got um, a couple of those. So they're okay. Uh, Susan, hi, Sue from Derby. <laughs> okay. Uh, Teresa, for botanicals, correct. Especially the hot press paper as well. They're pretty good. I've got to say, because she used the Windsor Newton for that. Oh, the, the Sinelia for botanicals, is that what you mean by that? Uh, so a quick look, Liz, I have a variety of makes, trying to make up my mind what works best for me. And the only way you're going to do that is just by trial and error, okay, so bear that in mind. Oh, also, one thing to remember as well, is that I tend, well, the way this video live works is that uh, on Facebook, I think you're about 20 seconds behind when I'm talking, okay? So when I say, now, count 20, and that's when you get it. <laughs> So bear that in mind. So that's a little bit, as I said, about testing your paints out before you start on a project. Okay, so that's that one. That was easy, wasn't it? Not a problem at all. Right, now, one thing I wanted to talk about is that, what is it? It is one of my most tried and trusted erasers, and it said rubber then, because I know in America it means something different. So it's an eraser, okay, and it's a putty rubber. I've, see, I've, Art eraser, apologies. But in the UK, we also call them putty rubbers. Just give some kind of ideas there. So it'd be like blue tack really, but I tend to use this a lot when I'm doing my paintings. So when I'm doing the drawing out stage, using graphite paper or anything like that, then you find this is pretty good for removing the pencil. So if you're working with a, a pencil area, what I would do, I wouldn't try rubbing it. I would dab the pencil with it. Then you can massage your pencil into the rubber just like that, and it's, it's nearly gone, nearly gone, and there you go, that's nearly gone now, I can keep going, it will go. Right, so that's a little bit about putty rubber, so this particular one, as I mentioned, or putty eraser, is a Faber-Castell, so that's a good one I'd recommend that you get uh, for that. Another one from Faber-Castell is that one there, which is not a putty rubber, or putty eraser, I keep saying it, but this particular one is pretty good for taking the um, the pencil off quite quickly. I just think that this this one is quite kind to the paper. So that's one I'd recommend that you probably use. Or something similar to that anyway. There's different makes on the market, obviously. Okay, so that's a little bit about putty rubbers. Oh, sorry, erasers. Ah, I'll get it right one day. Now then, this is a critical one. And um, because a lot of people very often ask me what brushes do I use and why do we use them? and do I use synthetic? Do I use um, sable? You know, should I use sable? Because we've got to think about the planet, we've got to think about wildlife and so on. I completely agree with everybody concerning sable. And that's something I'd like to go down the road of eventually when I find something of a substitute to the ones I tend to use. So if I can find a decent brush, which isn't sable, which performs the same as sable. I know SAA have got a new set out, which is similar to sable, but not sable, synthetic sable. Um, I'd be interested to kind of try those out actually, I'm going to have to go with them. I, think, I did mention it in one of the threads on here uh, the other day as well. So the ones I tend to use very quickly, I've got to go, we've got two minutes, I've got two things to talk about. So the brushes I tend to use are synthetic, which is this one here. This, as probably most of you already know, is my main, main brush which I use for all my detail work. So when I'm painting with this, I can get some nice fine lines. Just show you what I mean. So you can get some really kind of fine lines with this double zero brush. And it's a Windsor and Newton Cotman Series 111. And that's why I tend to use this, as you can see, because you can get some lovely fine detailed lines of it. And it's not too flexible either, so I can really control it. Plus, the bristles are not that long. So again, you've got a bit more control over the brush. So that's the Windsor Newton Synthetic. Now the other one I have got here, which I'll show you briefly, is a Rosemary & Co. and it's a Sable Series 93. Now I know that other artists use this brush as well. 
And this is Sable, but they do do a synthetic version of this as well, which I don't get on with. I have tried that one. Uh, good points. As you can see, Rosemary and Co. are a really good company. It's a family family business from what I understand. And uh, well worth having a shop on there if you ever get a chance. But as I mentioned, I do want to try and get away from Sable at some point if I can. So that's a couple of brushes which I tend to use on a regular basis. Um, other than that, that's really it. You can use old brushes. As I said, I've got a very old one which I use for mixing. And this is an old acrylic brush. And it is ancient. You can see where the paints will come off the handle. But I never mix in my palette with my decent brushes. I always use an old brush for mixing with. Okay. So that's something very quickly, very quickly about brushes. Because I've got about two minutes. I should have been off one minute ago, actually. I said I'm going to do 30 minutes today. I'll have a quick look at the um, website in a minute. What we got? Uh, let's have a look. Okay, Liz. Have variety in makes. Oh, yeah, I've spread that one out. I'll, I'll read you again, Liz. There you go. Teresa. Um, I have lots of sable, but fine. I prefer synthetic also. Yeah, snap. So do I, as you know. Susan Collins. I have white knights paints. See, I've never tried those, Susan. So I'd like to give those a blast one day. Again, you've got to think, well... How much do you spend? You know, how many different varieties do you try? That's why if you're in an art club and you've got friends who use different paints and it's worth having to play with different paints and just, just swapping occasionally. Um, let's have a quick look. Liz, I have a selection of both. Thank you, Liz. Okay, one last thing, because I do have to go. I did say I'll do half an hour, but it's going to be slightly longer than that. Is a little bit about white paint. Now, I promise you this at the beginning of this video, White paint is one of those things where people tend to be, I don't know, traditional maybe, is that the right word? Do I use white paint? Do I reserve the white of the paper? It's entirely your choice. I mean, do I, I don't know, do I use a brush and then pour paint off, you know, like so, and just lift the paint off the paper so I can leave a mark? You can do all sorts of things, but if you want really, really true white, for me, because of the fine details, I use white paint, obviously. So this is what I promised you I'd tell you about today. So one second, I'm just leaving the microphone a minute. If I take that away a minute, I'm going to plop all them down. You ready for this? Okay, here we go. I've got one minute to tell you a little bit about white paint. Three, two, one. <laughs> Okay, get up the coffee as quick as I can. Right, sort these out the way I want them, first of all. They're all over the place, running down my board here. Oh, they're, they're alive, they're alive. Somebody tell me. Okay, now the white paints I tend to use, as you can see here, I'll try and get them all on the screen for you so you can just see what I'm looking at, are just, at the moment, that one. That's it. Really? Yeah, honest. The only reason why is because I bought these out because I wanted to test these for, uh, for patreon.com forward slash a different artist, just down there, not just in the corner. I wanted to test them out for them, for my members on there, because I wanted to go through how each white paint, all these, apart from that one, perform. Now, they all do tend to perform differently. I say all. There's one which is very similar to the one I like. This is my favorite one, okay, which is the SAA Opaque White. The one which performs similar to that, if you ever looking on the market for white paint and you can't get the SAA one, is the Winsor and no, was it that one? Hang on, I forgot which one it was now. The Winsor and Newton Titanium White, which is this one here. The reason why, just swap those over a minute, is because both whites are opaque. Opaque, opaque white, and that says opaque on the back. Whereas some of them tend to be semi-opaque, or the class has been opaque, but they don't cover that well. So for my eyes, what I'd recommend is go for an opaque white. Make sure it says opaque on the tin or on the tube or whatever you buy. And um, look for that kind of thing when you're buying them. Another one you can buy is probably white gouache, which is this one, Windsor Newton again, so designer gouache. And that one is, let's have a quick look on there. Does it say? It doesn't really say. Oh, yeah. Just tells you the light fastness, which is how much it fades in the sun. Oh, yeah. And that's also a permanent white as well so that should be fairly opaque on that one I did try that one out but it didn't perform quite as well as these two okay one last one I can look at I mean, we've got other ones here we've got the Windsor Newton versions we've got the Aquarelle the Sennelia as well we've got the Horadam so different ones in there this one 
I used to use on a regular basis before I started using was color white and this basically is uh, the acrylic white paint titanium white now this is really good for really creating those very bright highlights especially when I add a color over the top give you an idea what I mean by that is that years ago I used to do a lot of fishing that I'm, you see where I'm going with this in a minute okay years ago I used to do a lot of fishing I used to make my own fishing, fishing floats out of um, out of polystyrene now to be able to make the um, the fluorescent color stand out we had to paint them white first we needed a permanent white so the fluorescent color didn't mix with the white paint if I put color over these you have to do it in one fell swoop otherwise it mixes with the white paint on the paper this one is permanent so you put a color over the top and that color will show through very bright vibrantly now unfortunately just near the end of the video we had a power cut a power cut that went out for quite a few miles around the village here so I didn't quite get right to the end of the video but I think I covered just about everything needed to be covered for the 10 tips and tricks on how to use water colors so hope you enjoyed that remember to click on like subscribe and share until next time around I'll see you again very soon bye bye for now